Self-determination, unity, collective work responsibility, cooperative economics, self-determination, purpose, creativity, and faith. Welcome to People of Color in the Bible. The purpose of this program is to educate all and to provide the true historical representation of people in the Bible. This work will also help the black community to establish a more positive biblical self-image. Brother Emmanuel has lectured in conferences and seminars, universities, churches, and schools. He's also authored a book on the topic. This program is a fantastic educational resource and can result in changed lives as one develops a better understanding of himself and the God who made him. Stay tuned now as we learn about people of color in the Bible. Self-determination, faith, and courage. We thank you for tuning in to people of color in the Bible. We appreciate you spending your time with us, and we pray that this might be a very exciting presentation to you. To many people, the information that we will share today will be new, will be shocking, will be as some might call revolutionary but they're in the scriptures and that's what we want to be able to do find out what does the word of god has to say about people of color let us begin with a word of prayer so that the lord might be able to incline our hearts and our minds to truly understand what is the thus say of the lord oh gracious father we thank thee for your blessings of having us alive today of giving us this opportunity to hear your word. We ask that whatever we say, we ask that it might come from your word, that you might be able to give us spiritual eyesight, that we might be able to discern between truth and error, and that you might be able to instruct us. Hide me behind the cross of Christ, and please, Lord, not it be my words, but yours. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. People of color in the Bible is divided up into four different sections. And what we want to do is cover these four major points or purposes of this presentation. First is to show that the Bible events occurred in classical Africa and that Africa is in fact the cradle of civilization and that the Garden of Eden was located. Point two is to show that the religion of the Bible is the religion of our forefathers who are beyond a shadow of a doubt the great patriots and women of the Bible. Point three is to acquaint people with the rich biblical legacy and heritage that we have as black people. And point four is to show that the greatness that we had as a people and as a nation is once again obtainable, but only as we return to God. Let us look at the Garden of Eden and try to get an understanding of what the Bible says. We're going to turn to Genesis chapter two and we're going to read verse number 10. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 10. Notice what it says. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Notice what the scripture says. It says that a river came out of the garden of Eden, and it divided up into four different rivers. Now what we want to do now is identify what are these four rivers, okay? Notice what verse 11 and 12 says. And the name of the first is Tyson. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Birium and the onyx stone. Notice what it says. It says that the first river is called Tyson. Now, we don't have a river today that's called Tyson, but it tells us that if we, it says that this river encompassed or surround the whole land of Havilah. So what we need to do is try to identify where the land of Havilah is, okay? And to do that, we have to turn to Psalm 49, verse 11. That's Psalm 49, verse 11. And notice what it says. 
their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own name. What did it say? It says they called the land after their own names. Okay? Now, so what this is telling us is that if you had a son, then you would name the land after them. Or if you had children, they would name the land after their children or after you. Now, let's see if there's any examples in the Word of God. Let's turn to Judges chapter 18. We want to turn to the book of Judges chapter 18, and we're going to read verse number 29. Judges chapter 18, verse 29. Notice what it says. And they call the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan their father who was born unto Israel. Howbeit the name of the city was Lachish at the first. Now notice what it says here. It says that they call the name of the city what? Dan after their father or after their particular tribe okay that's one example let's look at another example when we look at the Canaanites okay they dwelt in the land of Canaan now the question was there was one of the children of Ham was called Canaan and so the land was named after what after one of the sons of Ham so that becomes important okay now the question is well do we have any children that is named Havilah yes if you look at our charts you will find out that Ham, who's the father of the Africans, had a son called Cush. And that word, Cush, is translated Ethiopia. And Cush had a son called Havilah. So we should expect to find the land of Havilah under the Ethiopian Empire. Now we have to remember that the Ethiopian Empire extended as far as India and as far as China. They had a massive empire. And so, of course, you look at our charts, you will see that Havilah is between the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, and that's in what we would call today the Middle East. Okay, let's look at the second river, Genesis chapter 2. We're back to Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to read verse number 13. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it. that compass the whole land of Ethiopia. Let me ask you a question today. Do you know any river in the world that surrounds the land of Ethiopia? You ought to. It's the longest river in the entire world. Yes, it is called the Nile River. The Nile River begins in the heart of Africa, and what it does is it comes out of Africa and flows up through into Egypt. And notice where it flows into first? It first flows into what we call Upper Egypt. And as it continues to flow, the Nile River, it flows up into what we call the Lower Egypt. And then finally, it dumps into the Mediterranean Sea. Okay? Now, that is the longest river in the world. Okay? And that is the Nile River. So at least we've been able to find one of them that is called the Nile, um, one of the rivers, which is Gihon, which is called the Nile River. Notice, according to an 11th century Bible scholar, he says that this river, Gihon, is the Nile River. Let's read on in Genesis chapter 2, and let's see what the third river says. Genesis chapter 2, verse 14. The name of the third river is Hittichel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. What does it say? It tells us that this third river is called Hittichel. And if you read in the book of Daniel, Daniel, you'll find that the Bible talks about this river, Hittichel. And notice what it says. It says it flows toward Assyria. Okay? Now, do you know any river that flows toward the east of Assyria? Okay? Now, we see here, this is Assyria right here, okay? So we'd have to find a river that flows east toward Assyria. And if you look, you'll find out that it's what? Called the Tigris River. Right here it tells us. It's the Tigris River that flows 
toward the east of Assyria. So now we've been able to at least identify two of the rivers. One is called the, um, the Nile River. Another one is called the Tigris River. Okay? Now notice what else it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 14. And the fourth river is Euphrates. So the Bible tells us what the fourth river is. Now everyone knows where the Euphrates River is, don't you? Yes. The Euphrates River is parallel the Tigris River. It is right next to the Tigris River. Here's the Tigris River, and here is the Euphrates River. Okay? So out of all the four rivers that the Bible has told us about, we have been able to at least identify three of them. And the three rivers that we've been able to identify are the Nile, which flows in the heart of Africa, the Tigris River, and also the Euphrates River. And the other river, which is called Pison, we found out that that river is between the um, Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. Okay? That becomes very important. Now, according to a Greek historian, he says that the Kushite Ethiopians were the absolute governing class in politics, army, and the arts. Kushite scientific knowledge, medicine, and art spread about 2800 B.C. to 2300 B.C. Now, notice what it says. This um, Greek historian says that the Kushite controlled the world and was the absolute governing class for 500 years. That's a long time. And he tells us who they were. Now, one question people might want to know is, what is called classical Africa? I used that phrase in the beginning. Now, classical Africa, according to the Bible, is what we call today Africa and what we call the Middle East. The Middle East and Africa were all one continent in the past, okay? And that becomes very important, okay? Now, when we return, we're going to look in detail from the scriptures of how the scripture tells us that the Middle East or the land of Canaan, the land that he promised to Abraham, was from the Euphrates River all the way over to the, um, the Nile River, that that land is called the land of Ham and how Africa is called the land of Ham, and Ham is the father of the what? Of the Africans. So all of that land, what we call the Middle East and Africa today, is called Africa, or the land of the blacks. Death, determination, unity, collective work responsibility, Brother Emmanuel's book, People of Color in the Bible, is the result of four years of intensive research. Through the use of maps, charts, scripture quotations, genealogies, geography, and historical documentation, Mr. Emmanuel identifies numerous people of color in the Bible. Additionally, he cites their contributions to biblical history. As a bonus, this volume also contains chapter questions which make this book an excellent textbook for church schools, home schools, or personal Bible study. Other resources are available, including copies of this video. The original African Heritage Study Bible is a King James version of the Bible with maps and pictures that correlate with lectures and books. Three different charts are available to trace biblical lineage from Adam to Jesus. Additionally, this popular logo is available on t-shirts and can be purchased from the center. Brother William Emmanuel is also available for lectures or for speaking engagements. We thank you for returning to People of Color in the Bible. We were looking, we have been able to identify the four rivers that left the Garden of Eden. And so what we want to do now is be able to clarify where were these four rivers? We found one in the heart of Africa, which is called the Nile River. We also found the Euphrates River and the Tigris River. And so now what we want to do is look in the Bible and try to define on what the Bible calls classical Africa or the land of the blacks or the land of Ham, since Ham is the father of the Africans. Okay? 
The first scripture we would like to turn to is in Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 51. Psalm 78, verse 51. Notice what it says. And smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength, in the tabernacles of Ham. What does it say? It says that the Bible says that the chief of the strength of Egypt, Egypt is the chief of the strength of the tabernacle of Ham, and the tabernacle also means the dwelling place of Ham. So we see here that Egypt is called the chief or the strength of of the tabernacle of Ham or of Africa. And that's important to know. It should be. The reason why is if we look back in history, we'll find out that Alexandria or inside of Egypt, they had the greatest libraries in the world. And so, of course, they were this chinner or chief of Africa or classical Africa or the land of Ham or the tabernacle of Ham. Let's look at the next scripture. We like to look at Psalms 105. Psalms 105, we're going to look at verse number 23. Psalms 105, verse 23. Notice what it says. Israel also came into Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. Now let me ask you a question. Where did Jacob sojourn? Now some of you are probably saying, well, he sojourned in Egypt. No, he did not sojourn in Egypt. Where did he sojourn? He sojourned in the land of Canaan. Now that becomes very important to us. Why is that important to us? Listen, that means that if he sojourned in the land of Canaan, the land of Canaan is what we call is in what we call the Middle East today. So that means that the Bible says that what? That the Middle East or the land where Jacob sojourned is called the land of Ham or the land of the blacks or Africa. So the Bible connects Egypt as Africa and also the land of Canaan as Africa. Notice what also verse number 27 says. Psalms 105 verse 27. It says, they showed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. So he's letting us know where he did these signs. He did the what? The ten plagues on Egypt, which is in Africa, and he also had them wandering in the wilderness for how many years? for 40 years, and they didn't have to worry about any food. Also, let's turn to Genesis chapter 15. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18, it tells us specifically that the land that God gave to Abraham to sojourn in, because some people might be saying the land that he sojourned in, what land was that? Genesis chapter 15, verse 18, he tells us the land that he gave him to sojourn in, or the land of promise. Notice what it says. It gives you the borders. Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, and from the river of Egypt, which is the Nile River, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Until when? Until the Euphrates River. So we see here that what we're talking about is what specific land? The land of Canaan, or the land that was given to who? That was given to the land of Ham, or the land of the blacks. That becomes very important. Notice here on our map. If you look at here, this is the land that the Bible says that he gave to Abraham, the sojourning, from the what river? From the great river in Egypt, which is the Nile River, Okay, from this area, it says all the way stretching across, all the way to the what? The great Euphrates River, which is here. Okay, so he lets us know that this entire land, okay, that's bordered by Egypt and the Euphrates River, this entire land is what he calls what? The land of Ham. And he also told us that what Egypt was called the land of Ham or Africa. So we see that the Bible says that the Middle East 
and Africa are the same continent because there was no such thing as the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal was not put in until the 1600s. Okay? Now that we've been able to define from the Bible and get a better picture of where the Garden of Eden was located and also what is called Africa or classical Africa, we want to at this time to define who was the first man that he put in the Garden of Eden. We know his name was Adam. <coughs> and since his name was Adam, we want to be able to define what color was Adam. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Does God give us any hints or tell us the complexion of Adam? Yes, it does. In Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, notice what it says. <coughs> And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Notice what it says here. It tells us, number one, that God formed man from what? From the dust of the ground. That's correct. That's what we call today dirt or soil. Okay? Now dirt and soil comes in three different shades. The red, which we make bricks from or which, we make, which clay comes from. The brown one, which is the most common one you'll find on most farms or even in your backyard. And the last one is called the black um, soil. And that's where you will find in the forests and in the woods. That's the most richest soil. So we know that Adam was, cre was a man of color because he was created from the dirt. And dirt has color. Okay? What else? Notice what the um, Hebrew Greek Key Study Bible says. It says that Adam means reddish brown so it lets us know that the color of the dirt if you want to know what color is reddish brown you just pick up some dirt and put it in your hand and that's what color Adam was now God understood that and so notice what God said the word Adam in Hebrew means at ham this means red or taken out of the red earth so the Bible lets us know where Adam came from he lets us know what color Adam was and so we don't need not to understand what the Lord would have us to understand at this time in history. We also find out <coughs> that because of man was very wicked on the earth, and we know that Adam, he had Eve. He didn't have Eve. Eve was created from Adam's rib. And we know today that Eve had to be the same color of Adam if he came from her rib, if he came from Adam. And we know that Adam and Eve, they had Cain, Abel, and Cain killed Abel, and we had Seth also, okay? And after Cain killed Abel, we know the Bible talks about that the wickedness of the earth was great. And the wickedness of the earth was so great that God had to do what? God had to destroy the world with a flood. Now tell me today, this world is very wicked today, isn't it? And so do you think God is going to sit by and let the world become as wicked as it was in the past without destroying it? Yes, he is. He promised us that he would destroy the world the second time with what? With fire. Okay? And so that's where we are today. We, you, we need to all have a relationship with the Lord if we're going to be any good or have any effect here on planet Earth. And so the next thing we want to be able to understand is, do I know the Lord? Do I know the man who created me? Do I know the creator of the universe? We need to. You're going to have to if you're going to make it. In the past, the Bible says only eight saved, only eight souls were saved. Noah, his wife, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and their wives, and that's all that was saved. Now, in the same thing today, the Bible talks about that there's only going to be a few saved. It doesn't say the whole world is going to be saved, but you can make your calling and election sure by accepting the Lord, letting him change your life, change your thoughts, change your attitude, and change your ideas so that he might be able to both will and do of his good pleasure in you. Okay, at this particular time, we're going to look at questions. With every lecture, we always want to have what? Questions. And so at this time, we want to pause to have some questions. As a teacher, I want to be able to find out how much my students are learning, how much they're remembering. And so, let's look at these questions. At this time, it would be good for you to get a piece of paper and a pencil. 
so that you can write down these questions. Question one. List the four purposes of the presentation. Question two. On what continent was the Garden of Eden located? Question three. List three of the four rivers that left the Garden of Eden. If you can list the fourth river, that'll be extra credit. Question four. What color was Adam? And give two reasons why. Not your opinion, but scripture's reasons why. We hope that you've been able to tune in very clearly and that you have been able to appreciate this study. We know it's new. We know it's different for lots of different people, but we pray that it will have you understand the Word of God a little clearer. We pray that you will be able to also tune in for the entire series. This is only part one of a series. We have an entire series for you to see. And we pray that you might be able to also enjoy it. Now, one question that we wanted us to at least be able to think about, we didn't cover it in this section, uh, what were the three sons of Ham, I mean of Noah? And we believe that as time goes on, <clears throat> that at least some of us would have be familiar with the scriptures. And so we pray that you might be able to tune in for this fascinating and thought-provoking study on people of color in the Bible. Uji chakulia, umoja, ujima, ujama, uji chakulia, Thank you for watching People of Color in the Bible. For more information on lectures or for materials or a video copy of this program, write The Faith of Jesus Center. Self-determination, unity. Collective work responsibility, cooperative economics, self-determination, purpose, creativity, and faith. Welcome to People of Color in the Bible. The purpose of this program is to educate all and to provide the true historical representation of people in the Bible. This work will also help the black community to establish a more positive biblical self-image. Brother Emmanuel has lectured in conferences and seminars, universities, churches, and schools. He's also authored a book on the topic. This program is a fantastic educational resource and can result in changed lives as one develops a better understanding of himself and the God who made him. Stay tuned now as we learn about people of color in the Bible. Self-determination, faith, and purpose. Self-determination. We thank you for tuning in for part two on people of color in the Bible. This thought-provoking study will have us to restudy the Bible in a new way and in a truer understanding to understand who are the historical characters in the Bible. Now, as we need to probe into the Word of God, we need the understanding from the Holy Spirit. For without the understanding of the Holy Spirit, we cannot understand the Word of God. So let's turn to the Lord in prayer that he might give us the correct interpretation and the correct meaning of his Word. O oh, gracious Father, we thank thee for this opportunity to tune in for part two. We ask, Lord, that the hearts of the people that are listening in and that are tuning might be able to appreciate your Word, that they might be able to draw closer to thee, and we just ask that you might be able to give them all spiritual discernment, that they might be able to discern between truth and error. Give me wisdom and guidance from on high, and have it that it might not be my words, but your words. Please take, take control of me, my mind, and my thoughts, and my soul. Also the people that are behind us, the screen, and that are also doing their part. We just ask to lead and guide us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. At this time, we have been able to sufficiently study and been able to sufficiently see in part one what color Adam was and that the Garden of Eden was in classical Africa. 
We also now want to look at Noah and his sons. We realized before that Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Now, the next question is, well, where did these sons live? Well, Japheth, the Bible tells us, dwelt in the isles of the Gentiles, or what we call today Europe. And so, that's where they dwelt. Now, we also want to find out where did Shem children dwell? And those are, um, through, through his lineage came what we call today Abraham. And so, we find out that Shem dwelt in Asia and in Arabia. Okay, and now we also need to find out where did Ham dwell. Ham dwelt with Shem in Asia and in Arabia, but he also dwelt in Africa. Notice here on this map. This is where Shem children and Ham's children dwelt in what we call today a uh, Arabia, as you can see here, and the other parts of Asia. But also. Ham's children also dwell where? Also in Africa. So that means in Africa and in Arabia and in what? Asia. So Ham and Shem's children dwelt together. And Japheth's children separated themselves from Ham and Shem's children and they dwelt in what we call Europe today. Okay? Now, <clears throat> many people might be wondering of what contributions did they make. Now, we also want to look at, at this point, that Noah. Noah had three sons. Now, many people might think that Noah had three sons and that they were three different complexions. One son was white for the Caucasians, one son was black, and one son was oriental. Now, that's not true. That's not what happened. Man, Adam, we found out, was a man of color, and so Obviously, all the people back then up to Noah were men of color. So Noah was a man of color when he had three sons. Ham, Shem, and Japheth, they were all people of color. They were all from the same father. And so what we find out, or as I believe, as what had happened was that as Japheth's children dwelt up in what we call the Isles of the Gentiles or up in Europe, that they became lighter and lighter to what we call today of Europeans or what we call Caucasians. And we also find out that... Um, genetically, according to Dr. Hansen, that two black people often do have lighter skinned children. And if you look at the black race today, you'll find it as, as very light to the very dark coal. So in the spectrum of people of color or black people, you have all of these different colors. Okay? In Africa and in Jamaica today, it's common in different places that people will have what they will call albinos or lighter skinned children. And so, but it's genetically impossible for two Caucasians or whites to have a black son or daughter, okay? So we realize that it makes sense from Adam being a man of color, Noah being a man of color, and Ham, Shem, and Japheth being men of color, and from these three children, the rest of the world was populated. Now we want to look at some of the contributions of each of the children of Ham. That's what we want to start off with. Who was Ham? Ham was the father of who? Mizram, Put, Cush, and Canaan. Okay? Now, we want to look at Mizram first. The Hebrew word Mizram refers to, guess what? Upper and Lower Egypt. If you look back here on our map, right, on, right next to the Nile River, what do we have? We have Upper Egypt. Now, many people might be wondering, why do we have Upper Egypt at the bottom? Because the direction of the Nile River is dependent on how it was, okay, of how they were labeled. So you hit going up the Nile River, the flow of the Nile River would hit Upper Egypt first, and then as it flowed going north, it would flow eventually into what we would call Lower Egypt, and then dump into the Mediterranean Sea. So we see here that Mizram refers to Upper and Lower Egypt. Herodias the Greek insists that the Egyptians were black. That's very important to us. Herodias says that they were black. People in the Far East refer to Egypt as Mizram, even today. The black Egyptians had empires 
which extended in all directions. How many directions? In all directions. They were proficient in mathematics, medicine, engineering, and agriculture. They used geometry and taught Pythagoras, the Greek mathematician, all of his theorems. Then that becomes very important. How many of us had take geometry? And many of us didn't even know that the theorems that we learned in geometry were not really Pythagoras theorems, they were Egyptian theorems. Now when you're in your class with your teacher next time, you ought to let your teacher know that, that they're not really Pythagoras, they're not Greek theorems, they are Egyptian theorems. And if you're a teacher, we pray that you will correct yourself and tell your, te your students that, this, that these are really not Egyptian um, Greek theorems, but they are truly Egyptian theorems. At the time of Jeremiah the prophet, Necho, king of Egypt, received instruction from God to fight against the king of Assyria. Now many of us are surprised that God said anything to the Egyptians, but he did. That becomes very important, that we realize that the Egyptians did play good roles at the time in the Old Testament and in ancient cities, okay? Now, we want to look at one of the Pacific um, children of Mizram, and their name is called the Philistians, okay? What we want to be able to realize with the Philistians, that the Philistians, guess where they dwell? They settled in what we call today Crete. Now, let's look on our map here, just so that we can get a little background, okay? This is, right off the Mediterranean Sea, is called Crete, okay? That's where it is. Crete, right off the Mediterranean Sea, right outside of what we call Egypt, okay? That becomes very important. The Philistians established and controlled commerce, and they established colonies on the Mediterranean Sea. Cyprus is considered the birthplace of European culture. Scholars say that Egypt, that European civilization and culture, as we, knew, as we know it today, came from Africa through Crete. About 2000 BC, an earthquake struck Crete and destroyed its capital. They, the Philistians, migrated to Canaan and established colonies and settled in Palestine. We want to turn to Genesis chapter 20 for a minute, and we would like to look at a few verses. Genesis chapter 20, let's start at verse number 1. We want to look at a specific king. Genesis chapter 20, starting at verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country, and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gera. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gera, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. Notice what the Bible says. It says that God, amen, came to Abimelech. There's a Philistine king to it by dream by night. Now, the Lord wants to come to all of us by dream. The Bible promises in the last days in Joel that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Okay, now that becomes very important because guess what? He wants to do the same thing to us today. He wants to talk to us in dreams and in visions. He wants to reveal to us his secrets. Notice what else it says. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. And Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will thou slay also a righteous nation? Notice what the Bible says, that the, right, that the Philistines at the time of Abimelech was a what? Righteous nation. Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hand have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, yea, I know that thou did this in integrity of thy heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me, therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Notice what the Bible says here. That God had so much of a control over this man, he was able to keep him from sinning against him even when he was tricked. 
Now, how many of us, when people are lying to us and tricking us, that we allow the Lord to what? Show us and guide us. How many? Now, many of us, that we allow, that we walk so close to the Lord that he's able to show us these different things. But it's important that he did with this man. And it's important that we realize it. Now, many of us might be saying, well, how could that be? There was no righteous kingdom at that time. Oh, yes, there was. The people had the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments was passed on, or what we would call the Law of Moses. And when we return after this break, we're going to go into detail about the laws that God gave to Moses and the laws that he gave to Adam and Eve. Thank you. Brother Emmanuel's book, People of Color in the Bible, is the result of four years of intensive research. Through the use of maps, charts, scripture quotations, genealogies, geography, and historical documentation, Mr. Emmanuel identifies numerous people of color in the Bible. Additionally, he cites their contributions to biblical history. As a bonus, this volume also contains chapter questions which make this book an excellent textbook for church schools, home schools, or personal Bible study. Other resources are available including copies of this video. The original African Heritage Study Bible is a King James version of the Bible with maps and pictures that correlate with lectures and books. Three different charts are available to trace biblical lineage from Adam to Jesus. Additionally, this popular logo is available on t-shirts and can be purchased from the center. Brother William Emanuel is also available for lectures or for speaking engagements. We thank you for returning to People of Color in the Bible. At this time, what we want to do is we stopped when we were looking at the Philistines. We were talking about the law of God. Now, many people think that the law of Moses was laws, were Moses, laws that Moses thought of. And he wrote them down as he had wisdom to write it down. But that's not true. He got these laws from God. God gave him. Matter of fact, the Bible says that God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. Moses didn't even write them. But the statutes and judgments God gave to Moses and told him. Okay? Now, some of us might think that nobody could be understanding those laws beforehand. But if we look at the time of Abraham, we will be able to find out at the time of Abraham, guess what? That those laws existed. Now, to prove that, let's think about it. Let's think and let's go back in time. When God, the Bible says that God talked to Adam in the cool of the day. He communicated with him. And when he communicated with him, he told him many wonderful things. As one, for an example, when Cain and Abel offered up their sacrifices, the Bible says that Abel separated the fat from the sacrifice. Now, the fat was never separated from the sacrifice, and those instructions are only given in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and in Numbers. That's the only time that you find these things. Okay? So how did they know to do what the priest did year by year? Abel, because God communicated it to Adam, and Adam communicated it to Abel. Very simple. How did... Cain, no, thou shall not kill. Because when God came to him and said, what have thou done, Cain? Cain what? Cain fled. Cain knew what he had done. He knew that he shouldn't kill. But if there was no such thing as the Ten Commandments or no such things as the law of God, then he would have been justified in committing that sin. But he knew that thou shall not kill. Let's look at also the clean and unclean animals which we find in the, in the laws of Moses. Okay? At the time of Noah... Remember Noah took the animals into the ark? Do you know how they came in? Let me tell you how they came in. They came in two by two if they were unclean animals. But if they were clean animals, they came in by seven. That's very important. So that meant that at the time of Noah, that there was a such thing as clean and unclean animals. And there are so many instances throughout the scriptures, but those were some I just wanted to at least cite to us so that we might be able to have a feel. Now we want to look at the next son. The next son we want to look at is Put. 
And now the question you might want to know is, who's put? What does put have to do with anything? Okay, put was the next son of Ham. Put in Hebrew refers to Libya, which is in northern Africa. Cyrene is the chief city of Libya. Now let's look here on our map for a minute, and we will be able to find out where Cyrene is, okay, and Libya. As we can see here, we have Libya, which is in what? Northern Africa, okay? And the chief city of Libya is what? It tells us right here, is Cyrene, okay? So we see here that this is in where? Africa, okay? Libya. That's what put refers to in Hebrew. Now, how many characters do you know who are Libyan in the Bible? Do you know any? And I know some of y'all are smiling and saying, yeah, we know one. Simeon, the Cyrenian, or Simon, the Cyrenian, who carried the cross for Christ. Yes, you're right. But is that the only one you know? If you turn with me in Acts, Acts chapter 2, you remember on the day of Pentecost that when God poured out his Holy Spirit and 3,000 were converted, were there any Libyans converted? And were there any Africans converted? Well, the Bible tells us clearly in Acts chapter 2, verse number 10. It tells us that there were in Egypt and in parts of Libya about Cyrene. So what did it say? It tells us that some of the 3,000 that were converted, they were Egyptians and Libyans. So amongst the first Christians in the world, they were Africans. Praise the Lord. The Lord didn't forget us. I know sometimes we think that the Lord has forgotten us, but let me guarantee you, he has not forgotten us. Also, let's turn to Acts. Acts chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And let's see what the Bible else has to say. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians. What? Cyrenians, yes. And Alexandrians, do you know who the Alexandrians were, right? Alexandrians are Egyptians, okay? And of them of Sicily and Asia disputing with Stephen, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Now notice the Bible tells us that amongst the most learned men, amongst the leaders in the Jewish community at the time of Christ, they were Africans, Egyptians and Libyans or Cyrenians. That's very important for us. Okay, let's look at also chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 21. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 21. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenices and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but to the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and what? Notice what the Bible says, Cyrene. Those were what? North Africans. Which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now notice what it says here. It says that the Cyrenians, or the North Africans, went and preached the gospel to who? The Grecians. Who were the Grecians? Europeans. So that means that the Africans brought the gospel to Europe, not the Europeans bringing the gospel to Africa. How has things become so confused today? The Bible doesn't talk about the Europeans bringing the gospel to Africa, but it does say that the Africans brought the gospel to Europe. Notice what else verse 21 says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So amongst the Greeks, the Greeks received the gospel from the Africans, and many of them accepted the Lord. The power of the Lord rested upon them. Notice what else happens in Acts chapter 13, verse number 1. Acts chapter 13, verse number 1. Notice what it says. There were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene. Now notice what the Bible says. It says that there were certain what? Prophets and teachers. Did you know that there were some African prophets? And African teaches many things you didn't even know about people of color in the Bible. But the Bible tells us clearly they were Cyrenians. And so, notice that word Niger also means what? Means black. That's an African name. Very important for us to realize that. 
Okay? Now that we've been able to see that, and we've been able to see put, we want us to be able to realize that God has used us in the past, and he will use you again. If you allow him to change your heart, change your mind, change your soul, allow him to rule in your life. He created you. He's worthy of all the praise. He is worthy to be praised, and we are to praise him. Now, the next time we would like to look at is Cush. It becomes very important about Cush because the Bible says Cush is translated Ethiopia. Okay? Now, everyone knows who the Ethiopians are. They're Africans. They're very dark Africans. Okay? This term in classical literature generally refers to black people who inhabited Africa south of Egypt, like the Nubians and the Kushite. The German translation is the country of the blacks. Also, y'all remember, I'm sure you remember, about in Acts chapter 8, when Philip met the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, let me ask you a question. Why was the Ethiopian eunuch around at the time of the feast in Jerusalem? Why was he there? There was a very important reason why he was there, because he was a, what you call an Ethiopian Jew. You didn't know that Ethiopian Jews were down at the time of Christ. Yes, they were. They were living at that time, all the way at the time of Christ, such that you have these Ethiopian Jews coming on the stage of action. Now, many of us would like, many people are debating now, well, who, where did the Ethiopian Jews come from? Obviously, that they got information from the Lord, and they were being taught in the past. And so what we want to be able to do at this time is, to realize that these Ethiopian Jews, where did they come from? One came from Sheba, okay? Now we need to find out where is Sheba. If you look at the lineage again, you will find out that Cush had a son which was called Ramah, okay? And Ramah had who? Guess what? Ramah had a son called Sheba. And so obviously under the Ethiopian Empire, because Ramah was Ethiopian, you would have who? You would have Sheba. And so that the Queen of Sheba and Solomon had a son which was called Malak. Malak the first. And let's not forget that this Queen of Sheba was where the capital was under the Ethiopian Empire. We thank you for tuning in. And when we return, we'll be going over more details in that specific sense. We will go into detail of who were the Ethiopian Jews in our next part. But before then, we have a quiz for you. We want to make sure that you're learning something. We don't want you sitting down here and not getting the information that you should be getting. So to make sure that you are getting and that you're understanding, we're going to quiz you once again, if you don't mind. You can get out a pe pencil and a piece of paper and jot down the answers. Question one. List the four sons of Ham and their nations. Question two. What large righteous nation did Abraham have an encounter with? Question three. Who taught Pythagoras, the Greek mathematician, his theorem? Question four. According to the Bible, did the Africans bring the gospel to Europe? Question five. According to Martin Luther, what is the translation for the name Cush? Question six. How far did the Ethiopian empire extend? Question seven. The Ethiopian Jews traced their lineage back to which two people? Question eight. Name the three sons of Noah, and where did they live? Question nine. What two land masters were called the land of Ham, or classical Africa? <laughs> Thank you for watching People of Color in the Bible. Bye.
of this program is to educate all and to provide the true historical representation of people in the Bible. This work will also help the black community to establish a more positive biblical self-image. Brother Emmanuel has lectured in conferences and seminars, universities, churches, and schools. He's also authored a book on the topic. This program is a fantastic educational resource and can result in changed lives as one develops a better understanding of himself and the God who made him. Stay tuned now as we learn about people of color in the Bible. Welcome back to People of Color in the Bible. This is part three of the series. We pray that the questions that we have covered in part one and two that you have been able to answer adequately. And we pray that these are new and shocking things that we are finding in the Word of God because in the Word of God we should always be learning, the Bible says. That we've never come to realize that we know everything, but as long as we're learning and studying the Word of God, that's what counts. And we pray that this part we might even find more secrets in the Word of God. Let us go to the Lord in prayer at this time. 
<clears throat> oh, gracious Father, we thank thee for your love and kindness. We thank you for the word of God, which is inerrant, that shows us our faults, shows us our weaknesses, and shows us our strengths. We thank thee for being able to help identify people of color in the Bible so that we might be able to get a better appreciation of ourselves, that racism might be able to be broken down, and that we might all be able to gather together and praise your name. We just ask that you might be able to open our hearts as we turn to your word, as we open up to study again on people of color in the Bible. Break down the prejudice mind and give us spiritual discernment that we might be able to discern between truth and error and have it that it might not be my words but your words from the throne of God speaking to the individuals that many hearts might be converted and give their hearts to Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> we were talking in the past about Cush. That's where we stopped. Cush in the Bible is translated Ethiopia. According to Martin Luther, we found out that it means the country of the blacks. And so we also found out about an Ethiopian eunuch. That's what we were talking about. And we found out that the Ethiopian empire extended as far as where? India. And what else? China. That's how as far it extended in its empire. And so <clears throat> right now we want to look at who was this Ethiopian eunuch that came up to visit in Jerusalem at the time of the feast. Number one, we realized that this Ethiopian eunuch was an Ethiopian Jew because only the Jews would go up and worship in the feast at the feast days. So he had to be a Jew. And the Bible, and we do discover Ethiopian what? Jews today. The Ethiopian Jews that we find today are direct descendants from who? That's the question. Now what we want to do is find out who are the Ethiopian Jews? Who are their mother and fathers? Who were the ones in the beginning? Okay? And what we find out is according to the Ethiopians, according to their books, they say and document that Sheba, Queen of Sheba, visited the king of, guess who? Yes, King Solomon. You can find that in First um, Chronicles. Also, when you look at that, you can also find it in First Kings, chapter 10, verse number 13. Now, when we look at that, they also said that King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba had a son. Their son's name was Malek the first. Now, we already talked before about how we determined where the Queen of Sheba was. Was the Queen of Sheba under, um, was it an Ethiopian empire? Were they black people? Yes, we found out that they were, okay? And according to the charts, you clearly see that the, um, David had King Solomon, King Solomon, and Sheba married and had um, um, King Malak the first. And so what we want to look at is the next son. The next son of Ham is Canaan. That's the fourth son. Now, what we want to look at in Canaan is to find out who are the Canaanites. Now, and of course, everybody knows who the Canaanites are. Is that right? Okay. Now, what about the language of the Canaanites? Did you know that the Hebrew language was really the Canaanite language? Did you know that? Now, many of you might be saying, well, wait a minute. How is that possible? Well, according to the archaeologists, they found 400 inscriptions of the ancient language of Cana at the ruins of Carthage. Okay, that becomes important. The language is what we call today Hebrew. Now, I want to quote for you. The Canaanites spoke the Zidonian language. Now notice what it says, we Hebrew writers, we who write, we who write and feel in our biblical tongue have recognized at once that this recalled Zidonian language is nothing more or less than Hebrew, a pure Hebrew dialect, nearly the same that was spoken in the country of Israel. Notice what the archaeologists who are Hebrews are saying, they are telling us that Hebrew and the Canaanite Zidonian language are the same. Then that becomes very important to us. Why does it become important to us? 
because that means that the whole Old Testament was written in what? In an African, in that classical African what? Language. And that becomes very important. Okay, then what about the, were there any apostles? Did Christ have any apostles who were Canaanites? Yes, the Bible tells us that there was Simeon, the Canaanite, who was an apostle. So that means he was a man of color. It also tells us that Nathaniel of Cana. So we know at least two out of the 12 disciples were at least people of color because the Bible tells us so. Okay? What else do we need to find out? When you look at the lineage chart, you'll find out that Canaan had how many sons? Eleven sons. Zidon was one of them. The Hittites, the Hivites the Jebusites, and the Jebusites is where we talk about Jerusalem, also the Samaritans, and there were many others, okay? But let's zoom in and focus in on one or two of these at this point. The ones we want to look at is the one, one of most important ones, which is called Zidon, okay? And we're going to look here at our maps and be able to find where? Zidon, okay? This is where Zidon is okay right off the Mediterranean Sea and it tells us that we have Zidon and right next to it we have what Tyre remember Tyre and Zidon those are very important places in the Bible the Bible talks lots about them did you know that the Zidonians built Solomon's temple haha <laughs> many people didn't know that many of you might be saying well wait a minute how could um, the Zidonians built Solomon's temple when it was called Solomon's temple. Didn't, te didn't Solomon build the temple? No, Solomon didn't build the temple. Solomon was the architect, and he designed it. But the men who built it were who? Zidonians. Now, you might be saying, well, wait a minute. How do you know that? Okay? When King Solomon wanted <clears throat> to build the temple, he wrote, to King Hiram of Tyre, who was a Zidonian, and asked him for the wisest man that he has that can carve images and do exactly the best work on planet Earth. Why? Because they were building a temple to God, the king of the universe. And he said, we got to have the best. We can't have second best. And so that's what he wrote. And King Hiram of Tyre wrote back and said, there's a son of Hiram who married the woman of Dan, and they had a son who was skillful in every device. Now that becomes important because this man who was skillful in every device, he built and designed most of the stuff that was used in Solomon's temple. Now, we also find out that the Zidonians helped build the second temple. Also, we find out that there was a Zidonian woman who said, guess who? Elijah the Tishbite. Did you know that the, that, the, um, that, that Solomon's navigators were very knowledgeable about the sea, and guess who they were? You guessed it. They were Zidonians. That's correct. They were proficient in philosophy, astronomy, geometry, mathematics, and navigation. Tyre, according to the Bible, was most, the most ancient, important city of the world. Now notice, when the Zidonians met up with the Grecians, the Grecians didn't have an alphabet. And so they gave them the, their, their Zidonian alphabet. They also gave them weights and measures. And what had happened was that the Greeks adopted the Zidonian alphabet, passed it on to the Greeks. The Greeks passed it on to the Romans. The Romans passed it on to the Anglo-Saxon Germans and the Anglo-Saxon Germans pass it on to the British Isles, and the British Isles pass it on to who? The American language today. That's where we get alphabet. That's correct. That's where those languages came from. Also, we want to look at um, the curse of Canaan. Many people want to know, what is this curse of Canaan? Was all people cursed? No. People want to know, was all black people cursed? No, because we want to find out what the Bible says. Does the Bible say that all black people are cursed and black people only deserve to be slaves? And if that curse, when that curse existed by Noah, when was it? 
what people was it for? Was it for something in the past that already happened who obtained this slavery? Or is it something that's present that black people or a certain group of people on planet Earth need to be in slavery today? Or is it for the future, telling us about a group of people that will be in slavery in the future? Well, stay tuned and listen for this, those provoke, thought-provoking questions in a few minutes when we come back from our break. Thank you. That's determination, unity, collective work responsibility, cooperative... Brother Emmanuel's book, People of Color in the Bible, is the result of four years of intensive research. Through the use of maps, charts, scripture quotations, genealogies, geography, and historical documentation, Mr. Emmanuel identifies numerous people of color in the Bible. Additionally, he cites their contributions to biblical history. As a bonus, this volume also contains chapter questions which make this book an excellent textbook for church schools, home schools, or personal Bible study. Other resources are available including copies of this video. The original African Heritage Study Bible is a King James version of the Bible with maps and pictures that correlate with lectures and books. Three different charts are available to trace biblical lineage from Adam to Jesus. Additionally, this popular logo is available on t-shirts and can be purchased from the center. Brother William Emmanuel is also available for lectures or for speaking engagements. We thank you for returning to People of Color in the Bible series. We have covered in this part three already about the Zidonians. We covered also about some of the Cushites. We discovered about some of the disciples of Jesus. And now we determined that most people ask the same questions all the time. Are black people cursed? Is that what the Bible says? That black people are no good and all they're good for is being in slavery. Well, let's turn to the Word of God. Just let's see what it says. In Genesis chapter 9, let's read verse number 22 and 24. <clears throat> and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Okay, notice what else it says in verse number 25 and 26. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. Notice who he cursed. He didn't say that he cursed Ham, the father of all the Africans. It said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and, ha and Canaan shall be his servant. Then that's very important for us to realize what the Bible says here. It says that only one of the children of Ham was cursed, and his name was Canaan. It did not say that all Africans or blacks were cursed, and we deserve to be in the slave trade that existed in America. That was forbidden by God, and man had, because of racism, had used that to put us in slavery. But we want you to realize that that was not the will of God, and it has nothing to do with the Bible. Number two, we want to find out th these people who were cursed, Canaan, what was this curse? It says that they would be servants unto who? Unto Shem's children, who was some of the Hebrews. It wouldn't be that they would be slaves to Japheth's children, who were the um, Europeans. So not even the Bible even barely suggests that black people were supposed to be in slavery to Europeans. The Bible says no such thing. Now let's find out if that's something past, present, or future. If you read in the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 9, verses 3 through 27, guess what you're going to find out? You will find out that Joshua, when Joshua came into the land, they came in to conquer the land. After Noah died, or after Moses died, they went across um, the Jordan River, and they conquered Ai. And the Bible talks about that they also conquered Jericho. And then we find out that the Bible says that there were some Hivites and Gibeonites. That's what they did. They got scared, and they said, wait a minute, we don't want to die. So let's, tr 
tricked Joshua and these men. And so you know what they did? They dressed up in old clothes. And they got old um, bread. And they had it all molded. And they got old um, wine bags. And they went through the desert. And they said, oh, we came from a long, far country to worship the Lord. That's what we've come to do. And will you make a league with us? And they, Joshua and them, made a league with them. And then they went back away. And then three days later, Joshua and his men come up to these people. And they find out that they were the ones that they made a league with. And then Joshua tells them that curse it, that you guys are cursed forever. But now, what type of curse did he put on them? He said that you will be cursed and that you will be drawers of water and hewers of wood to the house of the Lord forever. So they were supposed to be servants to the house of God forever. And that was the curse that was put on them. So that was a curse that was fulfilled way back in the past. It's not something right now. Okay? And the Canaanites, as time went on, we find out that these Canaanites became the Nethanims. And what else, these Nethanims, what happened was that they later on came and they united with Israel. And matter of fact, they intermarried with them, and some of them became the most faithful unto the Lord. And so when they went into Babylonian um, captivity, guess what happened? That when they went into Babylonian captivity, when some of the um, Jews refused to come back into Israel and to Jerusalem, that many of the Jews refused to. But guess what? The Nephilim, these people who were drawers of wood, drawers of water and hewers of wood, they came back and followed the Lord when most of Israel stayed in Babylon during that particular time. So they became very faithful people. Tell me, aren't you supposed to be a servant unto God? Aren't you supposed to be a servant unto the Lord forever and your children? Yes, I believe I should be, and I want my children to be. I want us all to be servants to the Lord, not to man. Just don't mix me up. I do not want us to be servants to man, but servants unto God, so that God can both use us, according to his will and according to his good pleasure. The Bible says that he wants to dwell in us so much so that the world might not see us, but will see Christ in us. Those are the true servants of God. Those are the true people of God, and I want to be one of them. How about you? Now, you can do that by just coming to the Lord. You can allow him to change your life, change your thoughts, change your motives. He can take away that drug. He can take away many things out of your life. He can help you identify with the Word of God than never before because that's your history and you should not reject it. Don't let somebody tell you that this is not the history of you. This is your history and you need to return to the Lord because until we return to the Lord, we are not going to be right. But guess what? We need to turn unto the Lord. Now the next portion of what we want to look at is who are the Samaritans? Samaritans are a very important people in the Bible. And what we want to do at this time is look at some of these Samaritans. <clears throat> Who were the Samaritans? The Bible tells us quite a few things about the Samaritans. Okay? Number one, the Samaritans were a group of people when Israel, the ten tribes, were bolted against the Lord and, because, and they were Israel. And the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, dwelt in what was called Judah. So Israel, at the time of the Syrian Empire, because they had rebelled against the Lord, the Lord took them off into captivity and put them away in, Bab in um, Assyrian captivity. And we never hear no more about them ever again. But we find out that he took the Hamathites and put them in the land of Samaria. And these Hamathites, they were nothing but children of Canaan. Okay, so they were sort of Canaanites. And so they dwelt there, and so we find out as time goes on, at the time of Jesus, Jesus wasn't racist. Jesus wasn't prejudiced. That's not the way Jesus was. Matter of fact, the Jews hated the Samaritans. But did Jesus hate the Samaritans? No. You find out in John chapter 4 that many Samaritans believed in the Lord Jesus after Jesus spoke to a black woman at the well. We call her the woman at the well. And guess what? She was the first woman evangelist. She went out and told everybody about what Jesus said. Now let me ask you, are you doing the same thing? Are you going around the world telling everybody about that man, Jesus? Are you telling them how he changed your life or has he changed your life? Then if you were, you should be going out doing evangelism. You should be going out telling people about people about Jesus and how he can change your life. 
and how he can change this whole world. And so we see this Samaritan was the first woman evangelist. We also find in Luke chapter 10, remember about the story the Bible talks about that this man got beat up and then the priest went by and looked at him and kept on going and a Levite went by. But when the Bible says that when a Samaritan came, what did he do? The Bible says he came and he helped the man. And that's what the Bible called the Good Samaritan. Also, the Bible also tells you what else. It tells you not just about the Good Samaritan. You remember when Jesus healed the leopard? The Bible says that only one came back. Guess who he was? That's, you got it. He was a Samaritan. So we see that God had dealt with the Samaritans on a personal level. And God is no respecter of a person. And we ought to allow the Lord to change our mind, our thoughts, and our actions. We should allow him to make, to have him, to reflect himself in us. Now, the next point we want to look at is, who was Abraham? Where did Abraham come from? Many of us don't even know that. But the Bible says that Abraham came from where? Ur of the Chaldees. Let me show you on this map where Ur of the Chaldees is. Ur of the Chaldees is right over here. The Bible tells us it's right off to of what? What we would call today the Persian Gulf. That's where Ur of the Chaldees is. Okay? And so that means that Abraham was what? A classical African. Did you know that? Yes. He was a classical African. That's very important. So that means that the whole Old Testament was written about who? Classical Africans written about classical Africans, written to classical Africans. That becomes very important. Now let me ask you a question. How many wives did Abraham have? Do you know? Many of us don't know, but he had at least two, because the Bible says he married Sarah, and when Sarah couldn't have any more children, guess what Sarah said? Why don't you go into my handmaiden, Hagar? And the Bible says that Hagar became his wife, and he had Ishmael, okay? And when he had Ishmael, you remember who Ishmael was? Hagar's um, son. And Hagar was an Egyptian. So we can see here that Abraham and his children, what did they have? They had Egyptian or black, what? Servants or handmaidens for their maidens. Okay? And so we see here that Ishmael was a man of color or a black man because his mother was an Egyptian, was an African. And so eventually Sarah had what? Sarah had another one called who? Isaac. Isaac? Who was Isaac? Y'all remember who Isaac was? Isaac married Rebecca. And did you know that Isaac had twins? He had Esau and Jacob. Do you remember who Esau was? Yes. Esau married Ishmael's daughter and he also married two Hittites. And what about Jacob? Do you know how many children Jacob had? Yes. He had four sons. Okay? That becomes important. But what we're going to do at this time is go over some questions. It, because it becomes very important at this point that we can start to understand. Because when we do our last taping, we're going to go through each of the people of the tribe of Israel and define who they were. And we're going to find out if they married the Europeans, and we have European Jews in the Old Testament, or did they marry Africans, which would mean that they would be what? Black Jews. Okay, now let's look at our questions. Question one. According to Martin Luther, what is the translation for the name Cush? Question two. How far did the Ethiopian Empire extend? Question three. The Ethiopian Jews traced their lineage back to which two people? Question four. What ancient black language is considered a pure Hebrew dialect? Question five. According to the Bible, was Ham the father of classical Africans cursed? If not, who was cursed? And when or how was this curse fulfilled? Question six. What land and continent did Abraham come from? How many wives 
did he have? List them. How many were black? Question seven. How many wives did Jacob have? How many were black? List at least two of his four black sons. Kuji chakulia, umoja, ujima, ujama. Kuji chakulia, ni. Thank you for watching People of Color in the Bible. For more information on lectures or for materials or a video copy of this program, write The Faith of Jesus Center. Self-determination, unity, collective work responsibility, cooperative economics, self-determination, purpose, creativity, and faith. Welcome to People of Color in the Bible. The purpose of this program is to educate all and to provide the true historical representation of people in the Bible. This work will also help the black community to establish a more positive biblical self-image. Brother Emmanuel has lectured in conferences and seminars, universities, churches, and schools. He's also authored a book on the topic. This program is a fantastic educational resource and can result in changed lives as one develops a better understanding of himself and the God who made him. Stay tuned now as we learn about people of color in the Bible. We thank you for tuning in for part four, the last part of People of Color in the Bible series. We appreciate you spending the time and we pray that you have been greatly blessed and benefited by the knowledge of the Word of God that you have been shared. Now, we also would like to let you know that this is a multicultural type of work that we have been working on. We are not racist. We are not have any bones to pick with anyone. But we want to let you know that we are just trying to give the his true historical viewpoint of people in the Bible. We have Jeff and we also have Tim that are working the camera and is working the production of this program and making it possible for all to see. They're both Caucasian, so we just want to let you know that that's not what we're into. We want to be able to share all truth to all people for all time. At this time, we want to open up for a word of prayer so that the Lord might be able to incline our hearts to the truth of the Word of God as we enter into part four of this series. O oh, gracious Father, we thank Thee for Your love and kindness, Your mercy and Your grace that You have graciously poured upon us. We thank Thee for the knowledge of Your Word. We thank Thee for the truth of Your Word, that we might be able to truly understand what You have written about in Your book and what Your book was written to and who they were written about. Help us, Lord, that we might all draw closer to Thee that we might appreciate every race and their contributions to different things in society. And we pray, Lord, that we might remove prejudice from our hearts, our minds, and our souls, and racism. And help us, Lord, that we might be able to love one another as you would have us to love one another and to love ourselves. We just ask that you would give us spiritual discernment to discern between truth and error and hide me behind the cross of Christ. And I pray not my words but your words might be spoken to the people that you might feed your people with the word of God. In Christ's name we pray, amen. At this time we want to us to realize of what we have covered so far. We have covered a lot of information. We have covered a lot of things. We have been building a foundation for the word of God so when we read it, we might truly understand what God has to say to his people. <clears throat> Number one, we realize that classical Africa is where it includes what we call the Middle East and Africa today. And we realize that the Suez Canal was put in in the 1600s to separate Northeast Africa from the heart of Africa. And we found out that all of that was considered Africa in the past, or what we would call today classical Africa. We also found out that Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and we defined where they went. 
We found out that Japheth's children went into what we call the Isles of the Gentiles or in Europe. We also found out that Shem's children dwelt in Asia and Arabia with Ham's children, and Ham's children also dwelt in Africa also, and not just Asia and Arabia with Shem's children. Then we found out that Noah was a man of color, Adam was a man of color, and Shem, Ham, and Japheth were all men of color. And from that, we found out also that we um, went into detail of each of the children of Ham. We found out that Ham had four sons, Cush, which means the Ethiopians, Mizram, which refers to Upper and Lower Egypt, which would be the Black Egyptians. The third son we found out was Put, which refers to the Libyans. And then we found out Canaan, who were what we would call the Canaanites. All of these were African, or some would call classical African. Then we are now finding out who did Abraham's children marry? Did they marry Japheth's children, which were the Caucasians, and then we would have European Jews in the Old Testament, or did they marry Africans? And then we would have, what, black Jews in the Old Testament. And that's what we're going to study at this point. We're going to look at the Word of God and see who Abraham's children married and who were the true Jews at the time of ancient history. <clears throat> At this time, we want to realize where did Abraham come from? Many of us are not familiar with Abraham, and we don't know where he came from. But the Bible tells us that he came from, guess where? Ur of the Chaldees. <clears throat> and if we look at this map here, we find what? We find Ur. Ur of who? Ur of the Chaldees is where Abraham came from. So that means that Abraham was, guess what? A classical African. That becomes very important us to realize that okay now that we realize that Abraham came from classical Africa or from what we would call um, Ur of the Chaldees we also realize that how many wives did he have he had Sarah first and when Sarah couldn't have any children Sarah told Abraham to go into guess who her Egyptian maiden who was Hagar Hagar did have a son by Abraham and his name was Ishmael Ishmael is the father of what we would call the Arab nations today. Okay? And so, what happened with Sarah? Sarah eventually did have a son, and his name was called Isaac. Isaac had a set of twins, and their names was Esau and Jacob. And we find out that Esau, which means Edom, and he was red, the Bible says, he came out red, that he married Ishmael's daughter, who was a black woman, so that means that what? All the descendants or the Edomites were what? Were black people. We also find out that Jacob married, guess who? Jacob had four wives. Many people don't know that, that he had four wives. Who were the four wives of Jacob? First of all, Jacob married <coughs> Leah. He was tricked into Leah, remember. He wanted to marry Rachel, who he loved, and he was tricked by Laban into marrying Leah. When he was tricked into marrying Leah, then he winded up marrying Rachel. So he had two wives at the beginning. And in the beginning, Rachel couldn't have children. So Rachel said, Joseph, I mean, Jacob, why don't you do the same thing that um, a great granddaddy Abraham did? Abraham had Hagar also. So would you go into my handmaiden, which was called Bilhah, and he did. And Bilhah had two children. Guess who their names were? Dan and Naphtali. So at least according to the Bible, we realize that how many children out of the 12 tribes were people of color? At least two of them. They were blacks. Okay, at least two, Dan and Naphtali. And then when Leah stopped bearing, and she couldn't have any more children, she told Joseph, Jacob, to do the same thing. She said, Jacob, won't you go into my handmaiden? And guess who her handmaiden was? Her handmaiden was <clears throat> Zilpah. And Zilpah had two children by him, okay? And their names was Gad and Asher. So at least out of the 12 children of Jacob, out of those 12 sons come the 12 tribes of Israel. At least one-third of them, which is four of the 12, were people of color, or some would call black people, okay? So let's go on to see if anyone else married people of color or people that were descendants from 
African. We find that Joseph, Joseph was sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites eventually sold him into Egypt, and we know later on that Joseph <coughs> became one of the greatest leaders under Pharaoh in the empire, okay? And who did he marry when he was in Egypt? We find out that he married an Egyptian woman. And when he married this Egyptian woman, he had two sons by her, Ephraim and Manasseh. And because he had Ephraim and Manasseh by them, guess what that means? That means no longer is it just four of the tribes, but now we got six of the tribes of Israel are now people of color. Half of the tribes were, had black people? That's correct. Half of the tribes were black. And as we can see here, we can also find out very clearly that Joseph received a double blessing. And what was this double blessing? He received a double blessing over his brethren. The Bible says that Jacob gave each one of his children, they became one tribe. But since Joseph got a double blessing, his two children replaced him, and he had two tribes. And so we have six sons who were people of color. And let's go on. Is there anyone else who married African or classical African? Yes, there is. We find out, guess who? Simeon married a woman of color or a Canaanite. And guess what? So that means he married the African, or a classical African, and so that makes how many tribes now, people of color? At least seven. Are there any more? Oh, yes. The Bible gives us clearly quite a few, and we want to be able to define as many as the Bible would tell us. Do you remember Moses? Moses was mistaken to be a guess what? And Egyptian for how many years? For 40 years, the Bible says. Now, I know in the beginning when we have babies real small that white babies and black babies look alike. We know that. That's what people tell us at least. And since they look alike, but by the time you develop into age, when you get to 40 years old, there's no question either you're Caucasian or you're black. It's, it's not no mix-up at that point. And so, but the Bible says that Moses was mistaken to be an Egyptian all of these years. He could pass as a black man. So if he could pass as any black Egyptian, that means he had to look like a what? An Egyptian. And what tribe was Moses from? Moses was from the tribe of Levi. The Bible does tell us that the Levites and the Simeons, that they took um, women that were from Canaan and that they were black women. And so we realize also in um, Ezra chapter 9 that the Bible tells us that Levites married many black women. And so we see here that at least how many tribes were what? Black or people of color? At least eight so far. Now, do you really want to find out how many were? Well, let me tell you this. For you to find out that there were more people of color in the Bible, guess what you'll have to do? You're going to have to come back after this break. Brother Emmanuel's book, People of Color in the Bible, is the result of four years of intensive research. Through the use of maps, charts, scripture quotations, genealogies, geography, and historical documentation, Mr. Emmanuel identifies numerous people of color in the Bible. Additionally, he cites the contributions to biblical history. As a bonus, this volume also contains chapter questions which make this book an excellent textbook for church schools, home schools, or personal Bible study. Other resources are available, including copies of this video. The original African Heritage Study Bible is a King James version of the Bible with maps and pictures that correlate with lectures and books. Three different charts are available to trace biblical lineage from Adam to Jesus. Additionally, this popular logo is available on t-shirts and can be purchased from the center. Brother William Emanuel is also available for lectures or for speaking engagements. Thank you for returning to learn about the people of color in the Bible. We have already been able to define eight tribes who were what? People of color, who have either married an African directly from Egypt or a Canaanite 
which is also a classical African. Okay? Now that we know that eight of them were, let's think about it. Don't forget, they were surrounded by the what? The Canaanites, the tribes of Israel. So, of course, they would marry Canaanites. The Bible lets us know that, that that's who they were surrounded by, so obviously that's who they married. The Bible never tells us that they went across the Mediterranean Sea, went into Europe, had women by there, and then came back over. The Bible doesn't tell us that. It tells us that he's married the people who he's surrounded. And so we can realize that they were people of color or black people. Now that we have been able to identify those tribes, now we're trying to get into a few more tribes. We find out that <clears throat> the Benjamites at one time had become Sodomites. And when these Benjamites became Sodomites, that the other tribes of Israel came in and said that they were going to destroy them because they were going to let Sodom sodomy exist amongst them. And so the Benjamites went to war against all the tribes of Israel. And when they went to war, obviously they lost, and only 600 of their men escaped and fled up into the mountains. And when the Israelites came through, they burnt every city and killed every boy, every woman, every girl, everyone, virgins, everybody died in there. And then they came to their senses and realized that, wait a minute, one of our tribes are lacking. And since one of our tribes are lacking, guess what we have to do? We have already determined, because we've told the Lord that we would not give any of our children unto them, so guess what? They had to marry Canaanite women. And so the Israelites told the 600 Benjamites that had escaped that they could go into the Canaan land and take them wives of the Canaanites. And so now we got what? A ninth tribe that had become totally people of color, or as we were called, black. Do you know any great Benjamites? You ought to. Do you know that the first official king was King Saul? And guess what? He was a Benjamite. You're right. He was a black man. The same thing when you look at um, his daughter. His daughter married who? King David. Hmm, very important people. Do you know anyone else that was very important? Well, you ought to, because when we turn to Philippians chapter 3, let's turn there for a minute. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. We're going to find a very important character there. And he was of the tribe of Benjamin. And that's what we want to be able to see. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Notice what it says. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. So we have it here that the great apostle Paul tells us, guess what, that he was a Benjamite, okay? Now, since he was a Benjamite, my question to you is this, was he a man of color? The Bible says we have to have at least two or three scriptures to establish all things, okay? Now, let's see. Let's turn to Acts chapter 21. We're going to start at verse number 27 and 28. Acts chapter 21 we like to look at verse number 27, I mean 37 and 38 of Acts chapter 21. Notice what it says. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee, who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Notice what the Bible says here. A Roman soldier, a European, asked Paul, Can you speak Greek? Now obviously he didn't look like a Roman citizen. Obviously, he didn't look like a Greek because he would not have been asked, do you speak Greek? But notice what it says in the next verse. He says, art not thou that Egyptian? Now notice, he calls Paul an Egyptian. So if Paul looked like a black Egyptian, he had to be what color? He had to look like an Egyptian, so he had to be a black man. There it is again. Okay? So there we go. We got the most important, one of the most important characters in the Bible who wrote most of the New Testament as a man of color. Let's see if there's any other tribes that have the same thing. Do you know any other? That's nine tribes we're at already. Now just imagine, did you know that Judah married the Canaanite? That would make how many tribes now? Ten tribes as people of color. Now, when Judah married the Canaanites, do you know who came through the tribe of Judah who were very important? Yes, you're right, King David. Did you know that in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 12, and 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 42, it tells us that King David was ruddy? 
You might not have known that. So that means he was like a what? He was a reddish brown complexion. If you pick up dirt, then you would see what color King David was. He was looked like a regular classical African. Also, when you look at the lineage in the book of Matthew and Luke, and you look at the lineage, guess what you find in the lineage of Jesus? Did you know that Salem married Rahab the harlot? Now, you know Rahab the harlot was a Canaanite because that's where she dwelt, in, a Can in the land of Canaan. And so since she was black and she married um, Salem, and Salem had, guess who, Boaz. So that means Boaz was what we call today a black Israelite, okay? Now, Boaz married Ruth, and Ruth was a Moabitess, okay? And the Moabitess, they were Moabitess Canaanites, so she was also a classical African. So if, since Boaz was black and she was black, they had, guess who? They had Obed. And Obed had Jesse, and Jesse had, guess who? That's right, King David. Do you remember King David? And that's why it should be no strange thing when you hear that David looks like a ruddy color. Because he was. His mother and his father was. His grandmother and his grandfather was. And so was all the rest of them. So now let me ask you another question. Do you know another important person? Yes. You should know him. Don't forget, the, the um, Israelites were surrounded by what? The Canaanites. And because they was, we got to remember that. We find a man who is called the wisest man that walked on the earth. The wisest king. The Bible says that, guess what? King David was his father, and if he was a black man or a man of color, and he married um, Bathsheba. You remember Bathsheba? Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, so that means she was a Canaanite. So that means if she was black, a Canaanite, African, and King David was a black man also, then guess what? Then King Solomon had to be a black man. So it shouldn't be strange when people read in the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5, I am black. That should not be a mystery. Many people wonder about that, but that should not be a mystery to us and so forth. From him, we have, guess what? Solomon married a Ammonitess woman and had King Rehoboam. And through King Rehoboam, all of the kings of Judah were what? People of color. They had to be, okay? And guess who was the greatest king of king and lord of lords of all the kings that ever ruled on the earth? You got it. That's him, King Jesus. That's right. So the Bible does tell us in Revelation chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Do you know what it says? Let's look at it for a minute. Revelation chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. His hair and his, his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass. So it lets us know what? That the, that the feet of Jesus were like fine brass or like the color of a penny, and also his hair is like wool, just like my hair. Also, let us consider Revelation chapter 2, verse number 18. Let's look at the ending part of scripture. These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Let us read that scripture again. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, the entire verse. And unto the church uh, in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like the flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. So there we go again. We have his feet as fine brass. So the Bible lets us know clearly that he was what? A man of color. Also, if you look at the, in Europe, if you look in Germany, if you look in um, Russia, if you look in Italy, if you look in Rome, you will find out that the most ancient sculptures of Jesus are called, guess what? That's right, Black Madonnas. That's right. And since they were called Black Madonnas, you know what that means? That what? When people, when they wasn't racist, they were what? They also recognized the black contributions of black people in this society. And so let me ask you a question. Now, now that we have realized this, <clears throat> some people might be saying, so what? Big deal. Why is this important to me? According to Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And indeed, we are perishing. We are perishing in the jail houses, we're perishing in the crack houses, we're perishing in the homosexual bath houses, we're perishing on the street corners, we're perishing in the gang wars. This is because we do not know who we are as a people, where we've been as a people, what we have accomplished as a people, and what we have the potential of accomplishing as a people. Most of the information that you have heard has been systematically kept from us or has been credited to others, while the most embarrassing information around us about us is being spread around the world. 
as a people, it is important to know that we were for 500 years the absolute governing class in politics, army, scientific knowledge, and medicine, and the arts. <clears throat> as a people, it is important to know that we were proficient in mathematics, medicine, engineering, and agriculture. It is important to know that the European civilization and culture came from Africa through Crete. It is important to know that the Zidonian alphabet was adopted by the Greeks, passed on to the Romans, passed on to the German Anglo-Saxons, passed on to the British Isles, and is being used by us today. So I pray today that you can see and be proud of the fact that Africa, your homeland, is the cradle of civilization. I pray today that you can see that the Bible is the religion of your forefathers, men and women who are beyond a shadow of a doubt the great patriots and women of the Bible. I pray today that you have become more acquainted with the rich biblical and legacy that we have as black people. And finally, I pray that you realize that the greatness that we had as a people and as a nation is once again obtainable, but only under conditions that we return to God. Can we be an overwhelming blessing to ourselves and to the world and to the universe as God used us in the past? We're going to have quiz at this time and we're going to go over some questions and we pray that you might be able to appreciate and understand these questions question one what land and continent did abraham come from how many wives did he have can you list them how many were black question two how many wives did jacob have how many were black? List at least three of his four black sons. Question three. List at least two or three major Hebrew personalities that were mistaken to be Egyptians. Question four. Can you list at least seven black personalities that were in the lineage of Jesus? Question five. How many tribes of Israel were black? Can you list at least seven of them? We thank you and we appreciate you sitting through these long series. But we pray one thing has happened, that your life would have been changed, that you will realize that the greatness that God has given to you, that you would like it, that you will not reject the Bible as your history, that you will turn to the Bible and study it as more than ever before, and that you might give your hearts to the Lord so that we might be wrapped in the love of God and that we might be reflected to the whole world. Praise the Lord. Thank you.